I'm glad to be before you once again to deliver a message from God's Word. I'm thankful for every opportunity that's extended me to do exactly that. Have you ever been told that you need to grow up? That you're acting childish or immature? Maybe even sometimes still do we hear these words. You need to grow up. Part of this idea I'd like for us to study or to read in our text this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 reads as follows. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. So we see that the Christian is expected to examine and prove their own self. This is done to know whether or not this one is in the faith, that I am in the faith. Now being a reprobate is one who is unapproved. They're no longer qualified and rejected. It follows then that one can know whether or not they're faithful. It also follows that one can know if others are faithful or if they are unfaithful. Part of this is how we are expected to grow and develop spiritually. As Christians, we must seek to improve in every aspect of our lives, in all areas of our life. Now, as newborn Christians, ignorance is expected. However, we are expected to grow spiritually. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. This requires constant effort, vigilance, and a continued and consistent self-evaluation. So with these things in mind, I would like for us to consider this morning some ways in which the Christian must grow in order to mature. First, the Christian must become more spiritually inclined. We note that one must possess a clean heart. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. It says there, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have lo uh, both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Here we find a list of things that the Christian is expected to think on. They must occupy our mind. The final result is that God would be with us. Do we realize the importance of such? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Couple this with Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, that as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The thoughts which we allow to occupy our mind eventually become words. Words go on to become deeds. Deeds go on to become habits. This is true of good habits. This is true of bad habits. No matter what, there must be time given to allow these habits to exist. Ideally, we as Christians would have good habits. We would go about making these good habits and maintaining them. Remember also why God sent the flood of Noah's day. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. Man chose wickedness over God. He continued these evil thoughts, and they occupied his mind continually. This prompted God to cleanse the world of sin with water. One day, God will destroy the world, but this time it will be with fire. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. It says there, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, to be unexpected, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It starts with our thoughts. The Christian then must develop right thoughts, good thoughts, and proper attitudes. Psalm 19, verse 14, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, which reads as follows. If ye be or then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Again, righteous thoughts lead to righteous deeds. Such allows us to be spiritually inclined, and it helps each and every one of us mature spiritually. Thus, to be more useful for the cause of Christ. Secondly, we must be faithful in our attendance for worship. Attending worship assemblies must be regular. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, there says, And let us continue, or consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, when a Christian forsakes the assembly, they desert the brethren. The military term is they went AWOL, absent without leave. The Christian has no right to forsake the assemblies for worship, yet oftentimes this occurs. This only exhibits their own immaturity, spiritually speaking. This is done when a Christian chooses something else, somewhere else to be, rather than the assembly with the saints. By so doing, they are unable to provoke and exhort their brethren. Likewise, they're also unable to, to be provoked and to be exhorted by the brethren themselves. How would one define faithful attendance? Think about the following questions. If your car started one time out of three, would your car be considered faithful? Do you have to smack the engine a few times with a hammer to get it running? If you were to skip work two to three days throughout a week, would your employer consider you to be a faithful employee? If your clothes dryer only dried clothes every other time, is that a faithful dryer? Or do you think you'd go down to Sears or anywhere else to buy a new one? If you only made six of your house payments in a year, do you think the bank would be happy? you think your landlord would consider you to be a faithful tenant? I reckon not. Sadly, some attend worship just enough to evade those questions. Where were you on Sunday? We missed you. This is where you need to be. Some attend worship just as the multitude did of John chapter 6. Verses 25 through 27. It says there, And when they had found him on the other side, speaking of Jesus, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves, and were filled. Labor not for that meat with which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Are you the type of member we only see once a month, and that's because of the fellowship meal in the back? Or for parties? 
or for chili cook-offs? Where are you for worship assemblies, gospel meetings, lectureships? Some are here for the physical food, but not for the spiritual food. And even when they are here, are you playing on your phone, checking Facebook, Instagram, other social media platforms? Are you fully engaged in worshiping God as we are, as we must be on every worship day, the first day of the week? Christians must interact with one another in order to grow. We can encourage one another. We're expected to encourage one another. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, the idea there, the iron sharpening iron. We can provide strength or even needed rebuke to one another. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We're here to lean on, and we need others to lean on for ourselves. By doing so, by fulfilling these obligations, we become an organized body as God would have us be. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. The apostle there wrote that, When ye henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. You think of all the different joints, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the bones, throughout the human body. My elbow is usually sore. I, I think I slightly injured it at work the other, actually it's been about a year now. And every now and then it starts aching. I recognize that. Sometimes I just gotta stretch a little bit, move a little bit, warm it up. But I tend to it. I take care of it. What if I didn't have an elbow? Well, I wouldn't have the rest of my arm. Think about that when it comes to the Christian. Each congregation is meant to be a body. And we're meant to be fitly joined together. And we're meant to edify one another, to grow in love. It's part of maturing. Being together helps us to see how to act. When you're with older Christians, you learn how they behave. You see what they do and don't do. You also learn how they speak. You're able to mature as an individual. These are good things. And collectively, the church is also able to mature because of these things. Third, if a Christian desires to mature in the faith, they must be a better student of the Bible. Christians need continued spiritual nourishment. This comes only from God's word, specifically for us, the New Testament. But the Old Testament is there for our learning as well, Romans 15, 4. We see in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, that Jesus, being tempted, answered Satan, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We are expected then to rightly divide the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study or give diligence to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It takes work, but we won't be ashamed when God calls this world to an end. Those tests that we get presented, people might question us why we're Christians. If we don't rightly divide the word of truth, are we going to be able to give them a Bible answer to a Bible question? Most of the time, we don't. The Sadducees, we see, asked Jesus about the resurrection. 
extremely ironic there, but in Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, he responds with the following. He answered and said unto them, Ye do err, knowing not the Scriptures, nor the power of God. They were in error because they did not understand, they did not know the Scriptures. For them, this would have been portions of the Old Testament. And they didn't know them. Thus their question. The Christian should depend upon the Word of God just as we depend on physical nourishment, our daily food. God's Word teaches us how to be right with God. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3 gives us a contrast between the godly and the ungodly. Psalmist wrote there, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The New Testament shows how God sees us and it helps correct us. If we don't know the word, if we're not familiar with it, we cannot see our own selves as God sees us. James chapter 1 verses 23 through 25. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass or mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So we must be familiar with the New Testament. We must also put those things into practice which we learn. Knowing the word of God helps us defend against error. As we mature in the word, we can eventually tell between those things which are good and evil. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 13 and 14 read as follows. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So it takes practice, it takes study, and implementing the principles we learn, and then being involved with people who would try to teach us error. We see in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, that the noble Bereans tested an apostle regarding the scriptures. These were no, more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They received the teaching of Paul, but they checked it against their standard. Do we have that same boldness? If error was taught, would we be able to identify it? Would we know the word well enough to be able to defend against it, to combat it, to defeat it? God's word is meant also to help com to benefit and complete us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It is a reliable source because it comes directly from God. It provides us doctrine, reproof, correction, and righteous instruction. It leads, man, or leads to man's completion, thus it helps us mature as Christians. It makes us ready to perform each and every good work, not just some, but all good works. Fourth, we must grow in our love for the brethren if a Christian is going to mature. Christians are commanded to love the brethren. 
Obeying the truth involves a sincere love for the brethren. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. The unfeigned love here in this verse is actually Philadelphia. It's brotherly love. Yet he switches to the phrase love one another to agapeo, which is we're actively seeking our brethren's highest good. There is a familial bond which all Christians must possess towards one another, but we also must strive to give and to expect the best for our brethren. This is further seen in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. It says there, Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God dwell, of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We are to put on charity, or agape, love in action. Our love for our fellow Christians should be seen and heard. It must be demonstrated then by our actions, it must be clearly seen in how we communicate with each other. Jesus said as much in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. On the, in that judgment scene, Jesus pulled these people into account and gave them their sentence based upon their actions. We too will be held accountable for how we behave especially towards our own brethren. Our love should be sacrificial, just as Jesus himself loved us. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. But he qualifies it, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The apostle of love describes it thusly in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer shall have or hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. We can know that we're in the truth, we're of the truth, by doing the deeds of love, by providing for our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is one way that other people know us to be Christians. Disciples of Christ and how we treat one another. It shows that we as Christians are maturing as God expects us to. Our fifth and final point. If the Christian is to mature, we must learn to use our money wisely. Christians must understand the proper use of money. We are expected to work in order to gain this money. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28 says there, Let him that stole steal no more, 
but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. You see, we are expected to use our honestly gotten gain to help those who are needy, less fortunate than ourselves. This obviously would include our own families, but would extend beyond the borders of our home. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. And we are also expected to help the church via our monetary contribution. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. We must set aside a portion of our earned goods to make this contribution. It's not something that should be haphazard. We shouldn't be reaching for a wallet as soon as the tray comes around or a purse. And we'll give God a couple pennies, a couple quarters, a couple dollars. It should be purposed well in advance. We should be laying in store well before the assembly begins. We should be prepared for such. Now, obviously, sometimes we forget, but that should not be the norm. We must realize that when we do offer this contribution, we're giving it back to God. The church, though, is expected to use it correctly. The Christian must keep the proper perspective on money. We're given this idea that money itself can become destructive, but rather the, the, the love of it, not just the tool itself. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10 reads, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's not wrong to possess money. It is wrong when we possess the love of money, when we become greedy, unwilling to help our fellow man, specifically our fellow Christians. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 24, that no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon, or riches. These things cannot exist at the same time. We cannot be the servant of God while we try and successfully do serve earthly wealth. Much can be learned from what one spends their money on. We always need to buy groceries and we might need to buy fuel to get to work. But what kind of frivolous things do we purchase? Are they sinful in and of themselves? And if they're not, are they taking from what we could be contributing to God? Is it a matter of priorities that we need to rearrange? This is putting into practice Matthew 6, verse 33. What we spend our money on shows where our minds are centered. Now this morning we have considered some things that would help the Christian to mature because we are expected to grow and develop to mature as Christians. We see this with, with children, our own children, their babies. They grow. Otherwise something's wrong with them and we need to take care of that. If, if we are not growing as Christians, there's something wrong with us, and there's something that needs to be taken care of. This process of maturity must be done by continuous self-evaluation, self-examination, and putting into practice the principles that we've studied about this morning. And as we just said, these are simply putting into practice Matthew 6.33. We're seeking God first in all that we think, say, and do. One can know whether they are faithful or not. One can see it in others whether they too are faithful or not. Where do we stand? 
The growth process sometimes involves us sinning as Christians. It's not the ideal method, but sometimes it'll, it comes back into our life. We sin. Maybe we slip up by using of our tongue. Where we are, where we're not, what we should be doing, what we should not be doing. If this is true of you as a Christian, repent, confess, and pray for forgiveness. We typically refer to this as the second law of pardon. If you've sinned publicly, take care of it publicly. If not, take care of it in the way that it must be taken care of. However, if you're not a Christian, you can never be expected to grow and mature as a Christian until you, become, until you become one. In order to become a Christian, you must believe in Christ as the Son of God, John 8, 24. Repent of your past sins, Acts 3, 19. Confess Christ publicly, Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. And finally, be baptized for the mission of your sins, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. At this point, you are a Christian, and you're able to begin your walk as a new creature in Christ. You have received a complete forgiveness of sins, and the guilt of sin has been removed from you. Why not take the few moments we have before us to obey the gospel, whether becoming a Christian or putting the sin away as a Christian, and being faithful to God once again. So if you have either of these needs, please let us know as together we stand and sing. <laughs>